Hi everyone and thank you for joining me tonight. I'm going to be talking about the thyroid and how we can best manage that through different natural therapies, um, different ways that we can test the thyroid and what markers are talking about the thyroid. So let's go ahead and get started tonight. Um, this is just a disclaimer that I'm not giving any medical advice. And just if you are looking at some sort of treatment, make sure that you consult with a doctor or physician before starting any new supplements or treatment regimens. And this, again, is not giving any medical advice tonight. So for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Dr. Katie Takis, and I went to undergrad at Western Michigan University. From there, I went to Palmer College of Chiropractic in Port Orange, Florida. I am currently a diplomate of the American Board of Chiropractic Internists, a Dobsey doctor, and I'm sitting for my American Board of Clinical Nutrition here in a couple of months. I currently practice functional medicine in Birth of Colorado at Gateway Natural Medicine. So let's jump right into some statistics. It's estimated that more than 12% of the U.S. population will develop some sort of thyroid condition during their lifetime. That equals 20 million Americans who have some sort of a disease. That's a lot of people. Um, of those Americans that are affected, women are five to eight times more likely to have a thyroid condition than men. And it's estimated that one in eight women will develop some sort of thyroid disorder during her lifetime. Um, some other things that I'm not talking about a whole lot about tonight, but just that I thought was interesting is um, pregnant women with undiagnosed or inadequately treated hypothyroidism have an increased risk of miscarriage, preterm delivery, and other developmental issues in their children. Um, there's also been things that we've seen that women that have a hyperthyroid type um, symptoms, um, if, they, if that goes undiagnosed during their pregnancy, those children are at a higher risk of developing ADD or ADHD as they get older. So before we jump into the abnormalities, let's talk a little bit about the hormones and thyroid metabolism. So when the thyroid levels get too low, there's an area of the brain called the hypothalamus that secretes a hormone called thyrotropin releasing hormone. Um, if we see this picture kind of to the left, we see this um, this hypothalamus in the center of the circle, and it releases that TRH. So if we're moving in a clockwise fashion here, what the TRH then stimulates is the pit anterior pituitary gland. This is a gland that will release um, TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. I'm sure some of you have heard of that hormone before. From there, TSH sends a signal to the thyroid telling the thyroid to release thyroid hormones, and those are going to be T3 and T4. What the thyroid then does is it takes iodine from the body and incorporates it into two hormones, T3 and T4. And this is where we get T3 and T4 from. One really interesting thing about these hormones is I, the thyroid is the only organ system in the body to utilize iodine specifically to create hormones. So kind of a fun fact there for you. Um, and this conversion of T4 to the active form of T3 occurs mostly outside of the thyroid, um, more specifically in the liver and the gut. So thyroid, the thyroid has receptors all, across, all throughout the body. A lot of receptors are within the liver and the gut. So I'm also going to be talking about liver and gut health a little bit tonight, and we will get to that shortly. So the first hormone we're going to talk about is T4. This is secreted by the thyroid gland and is converted into T3. The, this is the major form of thyroid in the blood, and then that, that is throughout the body. And this can be directly measured as free T4. So this T4 eventually gets converted into T3, and this is what gives us the most action to the body. So this is the most active form of thyroid hormone that we have. As you can see, it's three to four times more potent than T4. So what these structures to the side are looking at are the actual hormones themselves. So this one is called T3 because there's three different iodines attached to it. T4 is called T4 because there's four iodine molecules attached to it. When T4 gets converted into T3, it loses an iodine molecule, and that's why there's one less iodine attached to it. So again, just keep in mind that this is the, the most active thyroid hormone that our body produces. 
The next hormone, and I kind of briefly mentioned already, is thyrotropin releasing hormone, or TRH. So this is produced by the hypothalamus, and you can see, this is a better visual, this picture of where the hypothalamus is at in the brain. Um, this little tiny area is what secretes the TRH. The TRH then sends a signal to the anterior pituitary gland that we need more thyroid hormone or less thyroid hormone. So the anterior pituitary gland says, all right, we need more TSH or we need less TSH. And kind of how TSH and T3 and T4 communicate in the body is somewhat um, of a checks and balance system. So if T3 and T4 start to get too low, then TSH should start to increase. If T3 and T4 get too high, then TSH should start to decrease. And this is how a normally, function a normally functioning thyroid should work. They should kind of counteract each other back and forth like that. Thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, I kind of just briefly mentioned that again. This is a hormone that's produced by the pituitary gland that stimulates the release, again, of T4 and T3. So that's what that hormone does and reverse T3. So this is a this is a marker not commonly talked about um, in traditional medicine. It's typically not in labs that would be ordered in traditional medicine. Um, however, I think that this is a very crucial marker to consider when we are talking about thyroid function. And the reason being is reverse T3 is the inactive form of T3, meaning they they look the same, they attach to the same receptor sites, except reverse T3 does not give us action. So what can start to happen is if T4 starts converting too much into reverse T3 and not enough into free T3, we may start to see these low thyroid-like symptoms, whether that's due to not having enough nutrients required for the conversion of T4 to T3, whether there's inflammation present, if there's an infection present, or again, if there's some sort of nutrient deficiency, we can start to see that T4 becoming more converted into the reverse T3. So I'm going to get into this a little bit more as we move forward, but I just kind of want you to keep in mind that reverse T3 is the inactive form. T3 is the most active thyroid hormone and T4 is what we have the most amount of in our body. And I kind of talked about this, but I'll go over it one more time now that I've been through all of the hormones. Um, we're talking about the thyroid feedback loop. So like I said earlier, as and you can see in this picture, we'll see that T3 and T4 levels start to drop. That sends a signal to the brain that we need to produce more TSH so that more thyroid hormones can be produced. So that signal continues down, and then we see at the bottom here, the thyroid shows an increased T3 and T4. So this is kind of how this feedback loop works in the body or in the brain in a normally functioning thyroid system. So a couple of things that we're going to talk about tonight, um, the autoimmune version of hypothyroidism and also the autoimmune version of hyperthyroidism. And some of the symptoms um, can kind of overlap between Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism. And when I say overlap, I mean that to have a low functioning or a hypo functioning thyroid doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have Hashimoto's. If you do have Hashimoto's, you do have a low functioning thyroid. Um, the same thing kind of goes for Graves' disease. If you have hyperthyroidism, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have Graves' disease. But if you have Graves' disease, then you do have an over-functioning thyroid or a hyper-functioning thyroid. So I'll kind of explain that as we go through. But first, we're going to start with Hashimoto's. So what this is, is there's auto autoantibodies present that kind of work against something called thyroid peroxidase, um, thyroglobulin, and TSH receptors. So essentially what's happening is the body's recognizing these cells and it's attacking them to try and make the thyroid function um, more optimally, when in a sense, it's kind of just attacking itself. So typically how this would present in labs would be a high TSH, low T3 and T4, and positive or elevated anti-TPO and anti-thyroglobulin. So those are the two um, markers that I discussed up above. That is what gives us our diagnosis of Hashimoto's. Now, these markers aren't typically ran um, in traditional medicine. We don't see it all of the time when people have low-functioning thyroid. Of course, it does happen at some times, but 
Um, there's a lot more cases that are undiagnosed than what we should be seeing. Um, some of the common symptoms that present with Hashimoto's are really dry or coarse hair or sparse hair, hair that's falling out or thinning. Um, the lateral thirds of the eyebrows tend to be really thin or no hair present at all. Um, something called periorbital edema, or that would be swelling around the eyes. And sometimes we'll start to see puffy or dull face with dry skin. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. It has a lot more symptoms as well. So these are a lot of the common symptoms we see with Hashimoto's. And again, this kind of goes back to these are very similar symptoms that we may see with hypothyroidism. Just because you have a low functioning or hypothyroid does not mean that you necessarily have Hashimoto's. So this, this slide is looking at symptoms for hypothyroidism, but they can also apply to Hashimoto's. So some of the more common ones I hear um, are fatigue, constipation, um, issues losing weight or gaining weight without a reason. Um, a lot of these people have insomnia or difficulty sleeping, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. Um, a lot of irregular menstrual cycles, especially um, in younger women, these patients will typically have some sort of cold intolerance. Um, they may have had issues with infertility, heavy periods, um, brittle hair, losing hair. And you can see there's a lot of different symptoms that can kind of show up with hypothyroidism. You don't necessarily have to have all of them, but you know, typically people present with at least a couple of these. So with that being said, the next one we're going to talk about is the autoimmune version of hyperthyroidism or an overfunctioning hyperfunctioning thyroid. So the autoimmune marker or the marker that we look for in this disease is something called thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin or TSI. And what happens with this one is the TSI looks very similar to TSH. So the body becomes really confused when a lot of TSI is being produced, which is just making that, which is kind of tricking the thyroid into producing more and more and more T3 and T4. And since it does resemble TSH, TSH doesn't necessarily change. It may actually become really low because the thyroid is being overstimulated to produce so many of those hormones. So a typical presentation of these labs are high T3 and T4 and a low TSH. And if we're looking at the autoimmune um, version of hyperthyroidism, we will see an elevated or positive TSI. Now, the same thing kind of goes with hyperthyroidism is what I said with hypothyroidism. You don't necessarily have to have, have Graves disease to have hyperthyroidism. So a lot of the symptoms on the next page are, again, going to be for both hyperthyroidism and Graves disease. Um, two of the most clinical presenting pictures or symptoms that we see with Graves' disease are bulging eyes or exophthalmus and a goiter, so the enlarged thyroid. Um, some other symptoms may include um, insomnia, again, hyperactivity, hair loss, excessive sweating. Um, these patients seem to have an issue with heat intolerance, so they get hot really easily. Um, they also may have diarrhea instead of the um, constipation that the hypothyroidism patients may have. Um, these patients may also have some menstrual irregularities. Um, and one thing that's kind of off note here but is interesting is um, symptoms of hyperthyroidism, as you can see, can sometimes present with hyperactivity. So this is something that is important to consider in children too, especially those that kind of have those ADD type symptoms where they are hyperactive and they can't sit still very well. So considering thyroid function in kids is always something that should be taken into account too, especially if they kind of have some of these symptoms. There is a lot of nutrients necessary for thyroid function. Um, these are just 10 of the most common or the most necessary things that we need for our thyroid to function optimally. And I'll get into that here. So the body needs protein, magnesium, B12, and zinc just to create TSH. So those four things are needed just to create TSH in the body. Iodine is required for the development of T4 and T3. Also to make T4, the body requires uh, vitamin B2 and vitamin C. And the body also requires vitamin D and vitamin A so that T3 can activate the receptor sites that it can attach to. 
Um, and then selenium and magnesium help to, to convert T4 into T3. So earlier I kind of talked about how T4 may start to get converted into that reverse T3 if we don't have enough necessary nutrients. So if we're deficient in any of these nutrients that are on this slide, then that could affect your conversion of T4 to T3. And if your body starts pushing more of your T4 towards reverse T3, then all of a sudden we have tons of this hormone that doesn't really play any action in the body. It kind of just fills the receptor sites, making it difficult for that T3 to attach to the sites and give action to the body that's needed. So this is this is really important to take into account how important your nutrition is and your, the foods that you're getting. Um, and we're gonna talk about why the gut and the liver also can play a major role in this because we wanna make sure that you're absorbing all of these nutrients so that your body can use them, utilize them as needed. Another thing I like to talk about, since the majority of um, patients that I see and people with uh, thyroid problems tend to be females, is something called estrogen dominance. And some of you may have heard of this before. Um, estrogen is something that dominates the beginning half of our cycle. So if you look at this picture on the right, that yellow line represents estrogen. And that is kind of the first part of our cycle. You can see at the bottom of the graph, it starts at day zero. That's the first day of bleeding of our menstrual cycle. So you can see as the month goes on from day zero, estrogen levels start to increase pretty significantly. At ovulation, we see a huge dip in all of these hormones. And from there out, progesterone takes over the second half of the menstrual cycle and kind of dominates that part of the cycle. So if for some reason we're seeing too much estrogen or those estrogen levels aren't coming down to where they should be, or the progesterone is so low that estrogen ends up being higher than progesterone, we may start to see signs of estrogen dominance. So common symptoms of this would be really heavy periods, um, lots of clot, <coughs> excuse me, lots of clotting with periods, or those big, thick red um, blood clots that women sometimes see, um, breast tenderness, mood changes around the cycle, endometriosis is a very estrogen dominant disease. Um, fibrocystic breasts, headaches, and uterine fibroids are all symptoms of excess estrogen or estrogen dominance. So how that can affect the thyroid is when there are really high levels of estrogen, the liver starts producing something called thyroid binding globulin or TBA, TBG. So TBG is a transport protein. And what that means is it binds to different hormones, the thyroid in this case, and circulation, and it helps to move them throughout the body where they need to go to. So what happens is, is if when TBG binds to T3 and T4, it decreases the amount of thyroid hormones that are um, available to use in the blood. So what ends up happening is, since there's less thyroid hormones available, because they're all bound to TBG, we might start to see symptoms of hypothyroidism. So sometimes when women come in and they ask me, well, what, what caused my estrogen dominance? Was it my thyroid or did my thyroid cause my estrogen dominance? You know, it's kind of a question of which came first, the chicken or the egg. I don't really know which one came first, but I know how they can both play a role in affecting each other. So sometimes by addressing the hormonal issues, we may start to see the thyroid start functioning better again, even without direct treatment to the thyroid. By working on detoxifying that estrogen, getting the estrogen levels lower than where they're at, that can really help to support the thyroid as well. So oftentimes, um, one of the more common symptoms that people typically associate with the thyroid is hair loss. Um, whether it's really dry hair, whether it's thin, greasy hair, um, there, there, there tends to be symptoms of hair issues in these patients. So with a low functioning or a hypothyroid, this may present with dry, brittle, or dull hair. Hyperthyroid may present with thin, brittle, and or greasy hair. And one really interesting thing is they found that early graying hair might be related to an autoimmune thyroid disease. And interestingly enough, they found that treatment to the thyroid may actually help to darken white or gray hair. So I had a patient a couple of weeks ago that came in and we were doing some work with her thyroid. And 
Um, she came in, we kind of adjusted her supplements and she came in about a month later and she said, I can't believe it. I have black hair again. I haven't had black hair in years. Um, and it wasn't a ton. It's not like her whole head was covered in black hair, but she was noticing that some of her hair was a little bit darker um, than what it was, which was all white. So that was just something that's pretty interesting and just something to kind of keep in mind as we're talking about these things. So how the hair follicle can relate to the thyroid. Um, the hair follicles go through a cycle of regression and regeneration. This cartoon is kind of funny. It shows how the hair literally grows, the phases it goes through. The last phase is called early antigen. And that's when the old hair falls out and the new hair grows. And then that's when we begin our cycle at antigen again, where the hair starts to grow. So how the thyroid can affect this is T4 increases the rapid development of keratinocytes, and this is what helps to create and develop our hair. Um, and it can also affect apoptosis, which is cell death, and this is decreased by T3 and T4. T4 can also prolong the duration of the hair growth phase. So if we go back, it can, it can elongate these two phases where the hair is still growing. Because T3 and T4 play such a major role in the development of the hair follicle, it is likely that uh, hair follicles can convert T4 to T3. So there's not a lot of research on this yet, but a lot of um, hypotheses that suggest that there may actually be thyroid receptor sites within the hair follicles themselves. And that's why we see such a profound effect on the hair when there is a very drastic issue with the thyroid. So the next thing I want to talk about is stress and the thyroid. So just to go over what happens during a stress response, I think this is really important to understand as we talk further about these things. So the first area of the body activated is that hypothalamus. And remember, I talked about that earlier. So the hypothalamus is the first area activated. This then sends a signal to the pituitary gland saying, hey, there's something really stressful happening. We need to respond. The pituitary gland then sends a signal to the adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands produce cortisol. So cortisol is considered our main stress hormone. This is, this is released anytime we're in a stressful situation, whether it's something that's stressing you out, like sitting in traffic, whether it's something that's stressing you out, like a breakup or a divorce or something like that. These all can cause our bodies to release cortisol. What happens with cortisol is it sends a signal to the liver to release glucose. And the reason being is our body is thinking, I have to fight or I have to, to basically run for my life because of this stress response. And this doesn't really apply to us as much nowadays as you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Let's say a stress response occurred where you were out hunting and all of a sudden you came across a bear and it's like, oh, oh my gosh. Am I going to fight this bear? Am I going to run from it? Well, your body needs something that's going to give you the energy to do either of those things. And our body loves glucose. This gives us the most energy. This is what our body needs to survive is glucose. So when there's excess cortisol being produced because we're stressed, it signals the liver to release this glucose. Now, in times of running from that bear, that glucose is going to get burned up really quick because you're going to run or you're going to fight. However, if you're sitting in traffic, you're not really going to burn that glucose up. Your body's just going to have this really high amount of glucose. And this sometimes is when we start to see um, people gain weight around their midsection or that excess belly fat that people can't get rid of. Um, this may also be when we start to see issues with insulin resistance because it can't keep up with the amount of glucose being produced. Um, and you can see how this can continue to create more and more problems. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention that happens during the stress response is the immune system is suppressed. And the reason being is your body is trying to focus on those vital organs that are necessary for survival. So your immune system kind of shuts down because it's trying to put all of its energy into this fight or flight response. So what happens here is increased cortisol can inhibit the conversion of T4 to T3. And T4 will then get converted to the inactive reverse T3. So with stress, we're already starting to see an issue with conversion of that T4 to T3, just a simple stress response. Increased cortisol can also increase something called sex hormone binding globulin, or SHBG, and it also decreases TBG. So what this means is this reduces the amount of hormones available 
in the blood and it makes it less available to the thyroid. Um, cortisol also increases glucose, like I said, and increased glucocorticoids, lower levels of TSH in the blood. So again, as that glucose is starting to increase, the brain will start to decrease production of TSH. So we'll start to see that TSH get lower and lower. Then we're starting to see this conversion of T4 into reverse T3 rather than the free T3 where it should be going. And then we have this increase of sex hormone binding globulin that's basically stealing all of our thyroid hormones and kind of not allowing them to be utilized by the thyroid as it should be. So a lot of issues can happen just from a simple stress response. Um, that's why I think it's really important to talk about how this can affect our health so much. Um, one Another thing I like to talk about is how birth control can affect the thyroid. I have a lot of women that um, ask me whether they should be taking it or they shouldn't be taking it. And I think this is a really good, it gives us a really good look at how this can affect the thyroid. So birth control will increase that sex hormone binding globulin, the one that I previously mentioned, and also thyroxine binding globulin that I previously mentioned in this last slide as well which will bind the free hormones. So again, what this ends up happening, what ends up happening when we see an increase in SHBG and TBG is these two are going to be grabbing our thyroid hormones as well as our sex hormones and attaching to them, which means there's less free hormones available for use in the body. So we may start to see low sex hormones and low thyroid hormones, and we may start to see symptoms associated with those things. So those low thyroid symptoms um, are kind of what I showed you earlier in the slide, the constipation, fatigue, insomnia, weight gain, um, and then low sex hormones may present as irregularities in periods, painful menstrual or painful periods, low libido, vaginal dryness, um, fatigue. So there's a lot of different things that we can see with low sex hormones and low thyroid hormones. And this is just from, this is just a basic effect that birth control can have on this. So, you know, throw in a stress response on top of birth control and your body's in a pretty unhappy state. And which leads me to my next point, the thyroid and amenorrhea. So amenorrhea is lack of a period or lack of a menstrual cycle. Um, so what this is, is low functioning thyroid can cause an increase in the levels of TRH. And if you don't remember, TRH is what stimulates the secretion of TSH. This also stimulates the secretion of prolactin, and this can lower the amount of estrogen in the blood. So prolactin can also inhibit the secretion of gonadotropins. And the two major ones that I'm kind of talking about right now are FSH and LH. Now, FSH and LH are two sex hormones that really help um, stimulate ovulation to occur. So without having that FSH and LH levels where they should be, ovulation is likely not going to occur. If we're not having ovulation occurring, there's no egg being released from the ovary. And if we already have low levels of estrogen and potentially low levels of progesterone due to the low functioning thyroid, there may not even be enough sex hormones available to even get this cycle going. So this could be why we start to see a loss of a period, the irregular periods, um, women that aren't ovulating. That's why it's really important to consider the thyroid when we are looking at some of these sexual disorders as well. So... I'm going to talk about inflammatory foods because this is a conversation that I have with all of my patients. Um, and I think it's something really important to talk about, even if we're not talking about the thyroid. So one thing is eating food allergies or intolerances creates an inflammatory and immune response every time you eat it. So not only is it potentially creating inflammation in your body, but it's stimulating your immune system to think that it has to fight something off. Continuous exposure to this can lead to constant inflammation being introduced to the body, and these foods can continue to affect the GI tract. This can also make things like detoxification more challenging, and this can make it especially um, difficult to detoxify hormones. So let's get into this a little bit further. Um, this is a picture looking at someone with celiac disease. So by all means, this is not what the inside of everyone's gut looks like, but this can just give you a general idea as to how the um, physiology and the anatomy of the body is affected when we eat inflammatory foods. And these pictures are from the American Journal of Gastroenterology, so you know that it's coming from a very um, reliable source. 
So on the left side, we have this picture. This is the inside of the intestines. So it's like if you cut your intestine kind of in half and peeled it open to see what it looked like, we're thinking of it as somewhat of a garden hose. This is kind of surrounding the inside of that hose. So these fluffy finger-like projections called microvilli, these things kind of, they grab nutrients and they grab vitamins and things that move through the digestive tract and they pull them deep into deep into these microvilli. And this is where a lot of our nutrients are absorbed at. This is a healthy looking lining of the gut. Now, if we look on the right side, this is a picture of someone that has celiac disease. And you can see that their microvilli are flattened due to chronic inflammation. So without those microvilli there to grab those nutrients as they're passing through, the, the, that person is not going to be absorbing their nutrients very well. And if you remembered in the beginning that I talked about how important it is for those 10 nutrients, the magnesium, selenium, the B vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin A, zinc, the other ones that I talked about, if those nutrients aren't getting absorbed in the gut, even if you're eating them every day, then this could be this could be playing a big role with your thyroid issue. So oftentimes people look at me and they're like, why are we talking about my gut? I'm trying to tell you about my thyroid. And this is this is kind of where I bring them back to. And like I said, this isn't necessarily what everybody's look, gut looks like on the right. This is a pretty severe case. But this kind of gives you an idea when there is constant inflammation in the gut and in the body, what how this is actually affecting us. So your, your gut, if you have, you know, what's called leaky gut or dysfunctioning gut, you may have areas that are not functioning as well that may resemble more of the right side. But this doesn't necessarily mean this is what everybody's gut looks like. So the purpose of where I'm going in this slide is it's really important to avoid those inflammatory foods because we need to be absorbing the nutrients that we, we're getting from our foods. Basically, you can take supplements all day long, but if you're not capable of absorbing them, it's you're not really doing a whole lot of good for yourself. So how the thyroid, gut, and liver are all connected to each other is, if you remember earlier, I said there's a the majority of thyroid receptors are in the gut and in the liver. Um, that's around 20% of thyroid conversion um, from T4 to T3 takes place in the gut. That's a lot of that's a lot of conversion going on in the gut. And if we have a gut that kind of looks like that dysfunctioning one on the previous slide, you can see that this conversion also may not occur as well as it should be. So the microbiome or the bacteria that exist within our gut, these help to regulate inflammation by inhibiting what's called pro-inflammatory cytokines. So maybe you've heard of these before, maybe you haven't, um, interleukin-6, NF-kappa B, um, TNF-alpha, these are some of the more common ones we hear of. But the bacteria and everything that exists within our gut is what helps to regulate this inflammatory response. So when inflammation increases cortisol, Cortisol increases, which can lead to that down regulation or the decreased conversion of T4 to T3, like I talked about earlier. Um, and this means less of the active hormone T3. So to kind of summarize this slide and where I'm going with all this is if the gut isn't functioning properly, we may see decreased nutrient absorption, especially nutrients that are crucial for thyroid function. We may also see decreased thyroid conversion. We'll also start to see upregulation or increased inflammatory cytokines. And once inflammation starts to occur in the gut, it can start to occur elsewhere in the body. Once that kind of gut barrier gets broken down or those microvilli become somewhat flattened or not, as func not functioning as well as they should be, these inflammatory cytokines are then able to enter the bloodstream and travel elsewhere throughout the body. That's why eating, that's why if you're sensitive to, let's say, dairy, that's why eating dairy sometimes may give someone acne, or it may give people headaches, or it may give some people joint pain. That's not necessarily contained to just the gastrointestinal tract, and that's why we may start to see these symptoms or sensitivities elsewhere in the body as well. So how the liver plays a role here is the liver takes up a large amount of T4 and T3 from circulation and processes these hormones. So it, it gets a lot of this from the gut. Um, T4 and T3 may become conjugated to the glucuronidide forms. So what that means is um, there's two different phases in the liver. There's phase one you can see here on the left, 
And this goes through a process of um, utilizing a lot of nutrients from the body to help kind of make that substance easier to process. So everything goes through the liver, whether it's horm thyroid hormones, sex hormones, caffeine, um, pharmaceutical drugs, any, everything goes through the liver to be processed. So the second phase of detoxification in the liver is called conjugation. And this is when things bind to these different hormones that have been somewhat broken down already. And it helps make them more water soluble so that they can be passed um, via the feces and via the urine. Um, glucuronidation is part of phase two detoxification. And like I said, that is what helps make these substances more water soluble. So how that ties into gut function and why liver and function is also very important is if our liver isn't functioning as well as it should be, whether we don't have enough nutrients to assist with detoxification, um, maybe there's a lot of fat surrounding the liver due to a poor diet, which makes detoxification um, difficult. Um, we may start to see a buildup of some of this stuff in the body. Um, for instance, estrogen is one of the more common things that we may see. If estrogen is not properly being detoxified. That may be when we start to see symptoms of estrogen dominance. Also keep in mind that I said um, there are receptor sites for the thyroid within the liver as well. So if the liver, again, is not functioning like it should be, that conversion of T4 to T3 may not be as efficient as it should be. So different testing um, that I, this is what I typically recommend to my patients, um, depending on if I'm looking for the autoimmunity component, um, anti-TPO and thyroglobulin antibody. These are the two labs that will assess for autoimmunity. Um, TSI is the test that will assess for autoimmunity for Graves' disease. Uh, TSH is the hormone released by the brain that tells the thyroid if it needs more or less hormones. Free T4 is the thyroid hormone that gets converted into the most potent, potent thyroid hormone of T3. This is also what we have the most hormone circulating in our body. Um, free T3 is the most active thyroid hormone. And again, that reverse T3 is the inactive form of free T3. And again, they share the same receptor sites and reverse T3 binds more efficiently. So if reverse, if there's a lot more reverse T3 in the body, it's gonna be taken up a lot more of the receptor sites, which means less function of the thyroid. Um, so these are some of the more common ones that I like to look at. And I think kind of going through all of this gives us a good idea as to why it is so important that we look at more than just TSH. So after I went through all of this, describing to you how all of these different hormones communicate to each other, how the gut's involved, how the liver's involved, you can see that it is much more complex than just running TSH. Um, so if this is something that you think that you're suffering some, suffering from some of these thyroid issues, um, talk to your doctor about getting some of these additional tests ran. Um, so different treatment things that we'll look at is B vitamins, um, essential fatty acids, dietary changes, thyroid glandulars, vitamin D, selenium, um, antimicrobials for the gut if it's indicated, different anti-inflammatories, um, vitamins A and C, potentially zinc, magnesium, protein, and iodine. Um, and just to kind of let you know, that's not something that I give to every patient. Um, there's not really a protocol that I use because every patient is different. Some women may have issues with their menstrual cycle. Or they may need to work with estrogen dominance. Um, we may need to work with decreasing their estrogen dominance first. There may be other patients that have a really poor diet and have really bad gut, and that might need to be where our function, where our focus is first. Um, there may be others that just really need a liver detox that need to get that liver properly detoxifying again. So each patient is going to be a little different, and I think that it's kind of a, um, it's not really fair to the patient or to the doctor to do the same treatment in every patient. So people ask me what my protocol is. I don't really have one because I try to treat everyone individually. Um, I will go over a case study of one of my patients that I thought you guys would find interesting. Um, so let's get into that. Um, this was a 40 year old female and I left some of her symptoms off just for sake of simplicity of explaining her case. Um, but these were some of her major complaints. She had a history of endometriosis with previous surgery, constant pain, headaches, low libido, fatigue, painful intercourse, low energy, heavy irregular periods, history of birth control use for 10 plus years, 
uh, cystic painful breasts, and she had a lot of night sweats and hot flashes. Um, she was also, one thing I didn't mention on here, she, her and her husband did have problems with fertility when she was younger. Um, a lot of that they said was related to her endometriosis. Um, so they kind of at some point just quit trying to have children. Um, so anyways, what I ordered in her in terms of labs were hormone tests, and I'm not going to go through that just because that's not the purpose of this webinar tonight. Um, a basic panel called CMP or a complete metabolic panel. This looks at liver and kidney function. Um, a CBC, uh, which is a complete blood count. This looks at uh, white blood cells and red blood cells. We looked at her in the iron panel because she did have such heavy periods and a lot of fatigue. We wanted to rule out if there was some sort of iron anemia present and of course a thyroid profile. So the thyroid profile was the free T3, free T4, uh, TSH. Um, we ran the markers for autoimmunity to the thyroid and this is our results. So as you can see here, the values on the right are the um, homeostatic reference ranges that I use. So they may be a little bit different from what you're used to seeing in a traditional lab. Um, the reason I like using these more narrow reference ranges is this is where I see people function the best. And um, we also, I want to try and catch things before they get flagged on the lab. Um, it's kind of the whole idea behind natural medicine. So what we see here is really low free T3. So you see that's at a 2.5 and that's um, out of the range of where it should be. We also have a low end free T4, which is at 0.99, still within the range, as you can see, but on the lower end. And her reverse T3 was 17.9, which was within range of where it should be. So the really interesting thing with this is we ran the thyroid peroxidase antibody and thyroglobulin antibody. Those are the two markers that assess for Hashimoto's. And you can see here, her numbers were pretty high. Um, that thyroid peroxidase shouldn't be greater than 34, and she was well over 300. And the thyroglobulin antibody shouldn't be greater than one, and she was almost at seven. So those were both pretty high. And it's interesting as we look at this, because had her doctor ran just TSH, none of this, we wouldn't have known that any of this was going on. Um, so that's why it's really important to consider all of these values when you are looking at a low functioning thyroid or even that hyperthyroid. So this patient fits the clinical symptoms of having Hashimoto's. Um, some of her other labs that were just worth noting is she had really low testosterone. Um, she had extremely high estrogens. So I labeled them as E3, E2, and E1. We do have three different types of estrogens. Um, but the E3 was the one that we were most concerned about, and this was very elevated in her case. Her DHEA was really low. Um, DHEA is something that's produced from the adrenal glands, and her progesterone levels were normal. Um, she did not have an iron deficiency, and her um, CBC and CMP didn't show any issues with um, infection or issues with her kidney or liver. So what we did for this patient was um, we gave her a thyroid glandular, um, B vitamins, selenium, um, high dose curcumin. So uh, may, you may have also heard of this as turmeric, um, DHEA, rhodiola, which is an adaptogen, and glutathione, which is one of the absolute strongest antioxidants that we have in our body. So that really helps to support detoxification in the liver. Um, the B vitamins are helping to support detoxification in the liver, as well as thyroid support. The selenium is definitely helping with the, with the thyroid support. Um, curcumin is helping to decrease the inflammation that's present in the body, giving her DHEA, um, the reason that we gave this to her is this is a precursor to uh, testosterone and estrogen. So since her testosterone levels were so low, we gave her DHEA to help kind of boost those back up rather than directly giving her testosterone. Um, rhodiola was to, again, help support the adrenal glands. And since that DHEA was so low and that's what's produced from the adrenal glands, that's why we gave her some rhodiola and glutathione, again, to help support the liver. Um, a couple things that I should also mention is she had previously been tested for food sensitivities from another physician. So she removed all of her food sensitivities and she was very strict and removed all sugars. So she went to a very, very low carb diet. Um, she no longer was eating any sweets, candies, anything like that. 
Um, she was getting sugar from fruit, but fruit was kind of the, I guess, highest sugar thing that she was eating. So overall, she pretty she cut that pretty significantly. Um, after two weeks on treatment, we had a follow-up and she reported improved energy. She says that she hasn't had any headaches. She hasn't had any night sweats. Um, she reports that this is her most normal period yet. She had less um, cysts on her breasts during this cycle than the previous one. And overall, she had decreased pain. So this woman had a lot of pain um, from her endometriosis. She was in constant pain. Um, she was having constant headaches. So this is a pretty significant change for her after only being on treatment for two weeks. Um, we followed up a month after her treatment and she, or a month after that following appointment or previous appointment. And she said that she had a little less energy during her period, but overall she's noted that it was still improved. She is now able to exercise a few days a week. And this was something really stressful to her before because she was so tired and in so much pain that she wasn't able to. And this was something that she really loved. So she was really happy to start exercising again. Um, again, she did notice the improved period. Uh, she said there was mild cramping and some breast tenderness, but nothing compared to what it was before. And she reports no more abdominal pain, which is pretty awesome. So two months after treatment, she has lost eight pounds since her first visit. Um, she said that this was her best period yet. That kind of seemed to be the trend every month. It was the best one yet. Um, and she said this month she wasn't even aware that she was starting until she went in the bathroom and noticed some blood. Um, so this was someone that days leading up to her period, she would know because she would be in such debilitating pain and she would have no energy. So that's pretty great that she noticed that so quickly. Um, she said that she didn't notice any mood changes. She had energy and not a lot of pain. She's no longer having hot flashes or night sweats. She says that her libido has improved and sex is no longer painful. And she said that she's doubled the number of steps on her Fitbit and is exercising four times per week. And she still has not had any headaches. So after only two months of treatment, she's feeling pretty awesome. Um, so this patient responded very well to care. And um, fortunately, in her case, we're happy that we found the Hashimoto's. Um, however, you know, Unfortunately, that wasn't looked into or ran ever in her life. So I am happy that we found it when we did. Um, so one more thing I'll note on this patient. I just saw her about two weeks ago, um, and that would be about 10, no, eight months past us working together. Um, and I hadn't seen her for two months prior to that because she's feeling so great that our appointments are every two months now, just kind of for a checkup. Um, and she still has, she's only, she's only taking two supplements currently. Um, she takes curcumin as needed. Um, so she's doing really great and she doesn't have any of these complaints anymore. So that was pretty awesome being able to see her quality of life improve so much. Um, and lastly, I just want to thank you all for joining me tonight. Uh, this is my contact information. My practice is Gateway Natural Medicine. That is the link to our website. That is a, a number to our office. And I am very active on Instagram. Some of you may have found me from Instagram. And our office is very active on Facebook if you want to check us out on there. And if any of you guys have questions at this time, I'd be happy to answer some of them. Um, otherwise, we can. Uh, I'll make sure you guys get a copy of this presentation tomorrow. So one of my questions is, um, how can we know how can we test for food sensitivities or what foods should we avoid? So one thing that you can do is a very simple way is a blood test that can look for your sensitivities. Um, one thing that we can do in our office is we can either draw blood or we can do a finger prick, whichever the patient prefers. And that test will show us a, a list of the 96 most common foods in the United States. And we can see what type of sensitivity you have. Um, do you have you know, an IgG type sensitivity? This is kind of more throughout the body. This can give you headaches, skin rashes, um, kind of more general symptoms, GI dysfunction. Or we may see an IgA response, which IgA is more contained to the mucous membranes. So people may notice an IgA sensitivity. Let's say you drink a glass of milk, you're sensitive to milk. Um, within a couple of days, you may start to notice your sinuses get a little bit more plugged up or you have a lot more mucus in the back of your throat or you feel like you kind of have to constantly clear your throat. And those are some of the just the more obvious or easy symptoms to see. We can't really necessarily see what's going on in the in the gut. Um, 
So testing would be a, the easiest way to do that. Um, what people can also do is considered an elimination diet. Um, with that, what that is, is you would remove something for a set amount of time. I usually recommend about three to four weeks. So let's say you think you may have a sensitivity to dairy. You eliminate all dairy products, milk, cheeses, uh, yogurts, every ice cream, you eliminate all of it. You go without it for three or four weeks, see how your symptoms are. If you notice improvement, it might be the dairy. If you're not really noticing any changes, it might be something else. After that three to four weeks, you introduce the dairy again and you see how you respond. If all of a sudden you're like, holy smokes, I feel like crap, then you know it was the dairy. Um, however, this can be kind of difficult as it takes a long time to only eliminate one thing at a time. So let's say you want to try eliminating four or five different things. You want to avoid gluten and dairy and peanuts. So you remove all three of those things, but to see what you might be sensitive to, you cannot introduce them all at the same time. You have to introduce one at a time. So that's kind of the way that you can practice or try the elimination diet. Um, oftentimes people will ask me if they're not really sure where to start or if they think that that's too challenging because it, it, it is pretty challenging. Um, a diet that I would recommend looking into would be the autoimmune paleo diet. Um, this removes the most common sensitivities um, and inflammatory foods that we come into contact with. And a lot of people report a lot of success following this type of diet. So if you're not really sure where to start, that would be something that I would encourage you to look into um, would be that diet. So uh, let's see, another question um, would be, uh, let's see. Um, so if the thyroid isn't functioning as well as it should be, and the sex hormones, and you, you're curious if it's an issue with your sex hormones, which one, which one do you think it is, or which one do you test? So um, that can go a couple of different ways. Like I said earlier, that could be related to which came first, the chicken or the egg. Did the sex hormone issues cause the thyroid issues? Did the thyroid issues cause the sex hormone issues? I don't know. Um, so a lot of what I base my decision on and what we're going to work with is based off of your symptoms. So I like to look at how is your gut functioning? How is your liver functioning? What do your periods look like? Did you have a hard time getting pregnant? Are you trying to get pregnant? Um, do you have a lot of energy? Do you have issues with your bowels? Do you have, and the list kind of can go on and on and on, the number of questions that I'll ask you. Once I go through this back and forth uh, interview of asking the patient a bazillion questions, I typically have a little bit better idea if I think it's more sex hormone related or if it's more thyroid related. Um, if I'm not sure, then we usually test both. Um, and typically we'll come back seeing abnormalities in both the thyroid and the sex hormones. And we work on trying to treat both. Like I said, that may start with gut, that may start with gut treatment, that may start with liver treatment. It kind of just all depends on the patient. Um, so thank you all for joining me tonight. I'm glad that you were able to join my webinar and I will get a copy of these notes sent out to you as well as a recording of this. If you tuned in a little bit late or just kind of missed a little bit of what I said, um, I will attach the recording for that as well. So thank you very much for joining me and I hope you all have a great rest of your night.